Welcome to the broadcast at 12 noon on the Ides of August 2013. Welcome to everyone that's attending and all of you who are listening to the recording at some future date. Um, the title of this uh, webinar is why most thermographers don't survey flat and low slope roofs. Thermographers like doing infrared jobs, uh, but they definitely uh, are averse to doing flat roofs, most of them. And the reasons, oh, the reasons vary, but the main reason is that there's so many different types of roofs, roofs, substrates, coatings, various and sundry things that are on top of roofs that interfere with your, with the, your view. Uh, and also, and more importantly, this is building science. And building science, as any of you know that have done infrared before on buildings knows, is quite complicated uh, because you have uh, the building is actually a system. And, um, and because of that, there's all sorts of things going on thermally um, with a building at the given moment when you're there. And trying to figure this out, when to be there and how to do it, is half the battle. So let me introduce uh, myself, Greg Stockton, and Ben Hickson. Um, ben, can you give a, uh, a little thing about your background that will let everybody know who you are? Certainly, Greg. Uh, ben Hickson, Hickson Consultants. We're building envelope consultants to the total building envelope uh, from the roof on down and been in it about 38 years now and uh, particularly enjoy what infrared thermography can tell us about the roofing and the walls. Uh, we uh, perform work all over the country and have enjoyed our alliance with United Infrared. Well, Ben, ben is um, an expert in, in buildings, roofing, insulation, and building science in general, especially with respect to roofs. And um, he is the technical director, along with his son, Tyler, um, for RoofScan IR. Now, RoofScan IR is one of three companies that I'm the owner of, which is uh, Stockton Infrared, United Infrared, and and um, Recover IR. And United Infrared Services is uh, actually a separate company, but part of United Infrared. And um, uh, we, we do a lot of flat and low slope roofs in Stockton and United. And we basically, um, if for those of you who don't know, you can go to roofscanir.com and look at it, but um, United Infrared, this is one of the uh, six or seven modules, uh, we call them modules, they're applications that we do training on. So um, uh, I'm also on the team, we have you know, Rob Miller, Gary uh, Michelone, um, uh, Jessica Bauer, and Peter Hopkins. And um, basically what we're trying to do is, is teach people how to do roof infrared in roof scan IR and what what's the story about the business and also the, you know we have to teach the technical aspects of it and that's what, what what we do in our training classes so we have a training classes and we have a network we consolidate aggregate jobs and then we send them out to the different people United Infrared Services is in charge of that and that's Rob Miller so without any further telling about us, let's talk about roofs. So uh, looking out on this roof, Ben, 
Uh, where is the water? Where is the moisture? It's um, hard to distinguish uh, where the moisture is in that roof. Uh, just looking at it, uh, it appears to be a fairly new roof, doesn't it? Actually, it's kind of a strange color for a roof. <laughs> but it could be anywhere. It could be uh, commissioning roofs is a really good um, a good practice. thing it is. It's a great. It's a. It's best practice, if you will. Um, after you put down a roof, especially after you recover a roof that was already there, and the reason usually that people recover a roof is because the membrane or the waterproofing layer is shot, and it's time to put a new one down. And um, and the, it's amazing the amount of waste that happens every day, every day, just tons and tons and tons of roofing materials that are perfectly dry as a bone make their way to the landfill. The insulation manufacturers take energy, and talking about energy waste, in, insulation manufacturers take energy to make insulation. They take energy to transport it to the job. People use energy to tear off all the, the, the perfectly dry insulation. When you pulverize it, put it into to dumpsters, and take energy to take it to the dump and dump it out, and it's just, we should just stop the madness. The trick is to have a system that works to find and delineate the exact place on the roofs that there's moisture that's entrained in the insulation and surgically remove it. Then you can put whatever coating your heart desires on or coverings. So what are the testing options? There's two. There's destructive testing and non-destructive testing. So under destructive testing, you got, you know, you can put pins in, stick things into the roof. It's destructive, you know, it makes a hole. Um, but it's pretty good verification, but it's only of that one place. Um, and you have absolute verification when you do core cuts, which is what we recommend after we do our infrared to verify, you know, that we've delineated, it, uh, you know, at least a couple of places, that, uh, take a dry and a wet sample and delineate. And Ben, can you explain to people, um, when you take a core cut, what happens with that sample if you, um, what are the options with that sample? Certainly the sample needs to be visually evaluated for uh, visible dampness or wet conditions, uh, the type of the insulation and the thickness of the insulation. And that might be several different layers and even different types of insulation, Greg. Um, depending on the roof system, for instance, in our uh, slide, we have a single ply with a isocyanurate insulation, but if we were taking the core of a built-up roof or a multi-layer uh, modified bitumen roof that was installed in hot mopping asphalt, we might have as underlying layers the almost closed cell isocyanurate, but the topmost layer uh, would be one of two things, uh, either an open cell insulation or a gypsum roofing cover board. So it's very important to look at the different uh, components in relation to their ability to hold moisture. Uh, you don't want to, from a commissioning standpoint, you don't want to sign off on uh, concealed moisture, uh, a buried cancer, if you will. And the same thing's true when you're envisioning uh, enjoying the economies of a recover roof. You do not want to roof over a damp or wet condition that can ruin the deck, and ruin fasteners, and certainly doesn't deliver to the owner the uh, thermal resistance that they have purchased. 
Okay, well, let's say that we cut a core, put it in a bag, sent it off to find out. I mean, normal normal um, way of doing this is obviously not to cut the core and then stick a probe in it because that was kind of, that would be kind of a waste. Discovering what is actually in the roof is important, but also. Um, if you bag it up and send it off, can you explain that process? Certainly. Uh, there are a number of tests that can be run. Uh, our emphasis is not on the components necessarily uh, so much as the moisture content. And laboratories can determine, compared to dry components, what the core cut components indicate in terms of percentage of uh, moisture held in the core cut. Uh, in the both the insulation layers and in the roofing materials. And that's valuable again because you do want to identify concealed moisture. Well, you and I were involved in a job here not long ago and um, we had one uh, sample that came back 140% wet. Can you explain how it can be 140 percent wet. Certainly. Um, in uh, looking at a saturated condition, um, the open cell insulation uh, moisture intrudes and replaces the gaseous uh, material or component that's in between uh, cells of the insulation. And saturation 100 percent wet can be exceeded uh, because the surface of the material can hold more of the uh, moisture and as the uh, insulation itself ages and further deteriorates, the um, more and more moisture can be trapped, if you will, within the almost closed cell conditions. So uh, you can exceed the 100% uh, moisture or saturated content, uh, like you said, maybe uh, 40 to 50 percent, particularly where he might be involved in the uh, roofing, roofing conditions. I just remember the first time I heard that, I went, okay, that's a little counterintuitive. It's it is. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the point of this whole thing is that if you if you cut core samples, you know what the roof's made of, and you not only know what the roof's made of, you know what you can test and find out what the content of the moisture is and percentages. And um, and we recommend that strongly um, verification after the infrared. You know, the infrared are pictures; they're not absolute verification. That needs to be done by a qualified roof consultant or roofer um, after we get done to verify that what we see on the map of the wet insulation is correct. Correct. We, we give thermal signatures and thermal patterns are what we detect and document with our infrared thermography. Alright, so, um, so there's three methods of non-destructive testing. Nuclear density gauges, which count the slowed neutrons. Dielectric capacitance meters, which measures differences in dielectric constants. And thermal infrared cameras, which measure differences in heat. The temperatures shown have little value. Um, we're just measuring the delta T's. So, What's wrong with the other, you know, we're infrared guys for a reason. With respect to roofs, infrared is far superior. And I, I'm going to spend the next couple of slides demonstrating that. Um, and there's one main reason uh, I'll get to. But both nuclear gauges and capacitance meters are used to take spot reading. So you put dots all over. And usually they put them in a pattern, which I'll show, the grid. Um, 20 by 20 is just so wide, it's ridiculous. 10 by 10 is the standard. 5 by 5 is better. Uh, but there, when you, you extrapolate 
um, where the water is based on the readings from the gauges and coming back into a map of the, trying to make a map. Um, and notwithstanding the faults and the inaccurate readings, which because they are not all perfect, um, uh, because there's a lot of things that can go wrong with the meters. And uh, given the amount of readings you have and the associated labor, the tiny sample of the roof is minuscule. It's 0.0001% of the roof. Uh, so it, it's a very small sample, and, and I'll get to why infrared's better. But um, the, the capacitance meters, we use those, the one on the right, um, in our, with our roof scan IR, we recommend every member have one of those. It's the most expensive one there is. It's like a grand. But it, it goes down pretty good. It's about four inches. It seems to be the best built piece of equipment that we've ever seen with respect to the meters. And we like having the meters out on the roofs when we're doing on-roof infrared. Um, just kind of to check our work, verify things, and, um, and give us a, a, a relatively good um, feeling, basically, as we're going through these roofs. Um, that we're hitting the wet and the dry. So you're standing out on the roof and you see a spot that looks like it's wet and you put it on it, it pegs the meter 100 and you go over to another part that's a homogeneous same section and you go away three feet and you put it down and it shows that it's dry and it makes the, the meter go zero or a few few percentage, then it makes you, it gives you a really better feeling about what you're doing while you're on the roof. So we use those on the roof. The nuclear density gauges, um, I, there are people in the United States, and, and I know a few, that are qualified to use these, use them pretty frequently, are pretty good at it. Um, it there's some issues that go along with having that source, um, which especially with respect to travel and you know, who can be under the roof, and there's all sorts of rules, um, and they seem, they, they, they seem to work. We don't in a particular like them too much, um, but they are a valid way to do this. And then you have thermal infrared, and the, the, the beauty of the thermal infrared is that you're getting the whole roof picture, not a couple of dots on the roof. You're taking a sample of everything. And, uh, of course, the biggest problem with it is the false positives, and we'll get into that in a minute. So meter surveys only work to prove that a roof is so widespread wet that it's ruined. It's beyond repairing. And th this is the mostly the way it's used. You go out, you put the dots on the map, um, and they all come up wet. You know that, or most of them, that you know that with that tiny sample spread out, and the dots that the roof is going to be shot. Um, they're also, you, they, they, and, and primarily, I think their value is, uh, other than the capacitance meter, you know, on the roof with you, um, is that they're, they're used to, uh, some roofs are not doable with infrared. And if they don't lend themselves to the infrared, then they need to be done with a meter. So, Whenever you can use infrared, it's always best because you get 100% of the, the, the surface. Now, how does this stuff work? Well, as it turns out, infrared testing, not just on roofs but everything, is based on pattern recognition. Uh, you go out, you, 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 the way you adjust the camera means everything. And um, the timing of when you're there means everything. And if you go out and you recognize patterns, and, and typically when we do these, we either make pictures or we mark the areas or we do both. And then we put transfer it to some kind of a map. It, the method is predicated on the fact that the thermal conductivity mass and specific heat, and therefore the specific heat capacity 
of a wet area is higher than that of a dry area. So if you have more mass, it's like taking a wrench and throwing it out during, in the afternoon onto the grass. That wrench will be cold in the grass until it equals out the temperature of the grass, and then it'll when the sun when you take the sun away, it will the grass will cool off quickly, and the wrench will stay hot. So this is exactly the same thing. So let's take a couple of pictures of some roofs and look at them um, for the sake of not to beat it to death, but I want to prove that this meter method is is goofy. So there's an infrared image looking straight down onto a roof. And uh, I'll, I'll just, I don't want to mark it on here, but you can see this area right here. Um, these, this one, that one, a couple of little spots have some wet spots in it. All right, so if you take the, oops, if you take the overlay and you take the photo and lay the CAD drawing of the wet over the top of it, it looks like that. And so the same thing you can do with the infrared. Now, here's a meter survey. I, it was spread out just like this, and, and that is very generous. The size of the dots are not actual. They're actually, the size of the dots are just so you can see them on the screen. They're not that big. But you see that 65 readings with a 10 by 10 grid results in zero wet. So again, this is not a way to, ver to see where, where the wet is in a roof. It is a way to verify if it's wasted only. Um, back to the whole idea of infrared, it's basically uh, thermal infrared is uh, seeing heat patterns. Uh, and the areas in the roof that are warmer are warmer because we do this work at night. Yes, you can do it during the day to a certain extent, but it's not a good idea. But 99.9% .9 of the time we do this work at night, and we're looking for the biggest delta T of the time when we got the best delta T, and that's the time when to do it. Now, looking at this graph, the dark line is the higher mass wet insulation. The blue line is the lower mass. So as you can see, twice during the day it crosses. At those moments, uh, which they're usually about an hour to two hours long, depending on the roof type, um, and also all the environmental conditions, it doesn't matter if you've got the best infrared camera on planet Earth. The wrench is the same temperature as the grass, so you can't see anything. So knowing when to go is one of the most important things that we teach in our, our um, infrared class. And knowing not only knowing when to go, but knowing when not to go, when to wait, when to go test it and look and see, all those things are important. I mean, you can do finite element analysis, and you can figure out the optimum time, but at, in the end, finite element analysis, where it's a great tool that I've used it quite a bit, but it's a great tool to try to figure out these patterns. Sometimes it's too complicated, uh, and, and you have to put all those factors in. It's, it's a little hard. So... If, if you think that it's it, uh, something about uh, 20 degrees temperature difference and everything, you don't know anything about roofs and roof infrared. The only thing that matters with respect to your, how you're going to have your success is what the solar insulation values are at the day when you arrive. Now, the people at Neural, which are solar uh, solar um, scientists, they've collected information and we went and got it all from the government and these are average temperatures um, or a average uh, uh, solar insulation which is uh, kilowatt 
hour square meter per day. So they've collected it over the course of 10 years and then they published it with a mean average and that's where this line comes from. You can see Phoenix, Arizona is a five all year round. What's it take to do infrared on a roof? Well, if you got a sorry camera, probably a four is about the best you're ever going to do. Three is the minimum that we recommend you doing it. I have scientific cameras that can do it with a one, but it's not fun, I can tell you. And a lot of times you have to wait. But if you look at Fairbanks, Alaska, um, it, it, it's a marvelous place for a couple of months out of the year to do infrared. It's, it, it's not that bad. But then those other times, you know, January, February, March, November, uh, October, November, and December, you can forget it. So like I said, it's all about how much energy is radiated into the roof and the roof substrate. At that time, during that period of time, you're, you're taking and you're taking the mass of the roof and the, and the whole roof system. You're increasing that temperature in that, and then at night, with a nice cool night, it's going to radiate back out into the atmosphere. It works marvelously. Now, this standard for wet for practice for locating wet insulation was written, I think, in the 80s. Um, it needs some serious updating. I'm sure not going to do it. <laughs> But it does need some serious updating. It, it, uh, we, we use it as, a, as our standard. We use it, but we teach much more than it goes into. Um, uh, ben, can you take the, uh, the four methods to do infrared? Sure. The um, first one there on our slide, the underroof infrared moisture survey is generally for identifying in um, metal buildings where you have a vinyl facer on bat insulation that is under the metal panel roofing. And when you're inside the building and look up, you can see that vinyl facer and your infrared camera can detect where moisture, the higher mass than the fiberglass bat insulation uh, is in the insulation. Uh, and well, I, got, be, uh, I have some pictures uh, in, in a later slide. Too. Uh, this can be very fascinating because uh, when you're walking uh, on the underside looking in one of these large facilities, you'll see the depressed areas where it's very obvious that there's moisture because it's um, depressed uh, the bat insulation and facer off of the purlins, but your infrared camera will pick up the thermal pattern or thermal signature uh, for areas that were suspected to be dry areas. And we train our members where to look. For instance, Greg, uh, they would look around the penetrations, uh, such as skylights, uh, rooftop mounted units, and the um, MEP penetrations of the roofing system because the flashing failure is one of the uh, failure modes for moisture intrusion uh, that we train them to look for. Uh, a second instance or opportunity for uh, infrared is uh, on roof, uh, the walkabout as our Australian friends say. And in our classes, we train that it's very important, number one, to look at the underside of the roof before you walk on the roof to make sure you're walking on uh, decking that's uh, strong enough, substantial enough to support you. Because you're going to be walking over this roof surface with your infrared camera looking for the uh, damp and moist uh, conditions. And this this methodology is the predominant methodology utilized throughout the country and you can be very, very successful um, in identifying concealed moisture with this methodology. Uh, the third methodology, I want to bring, there we go, 
This um, elevated vantage point is one that we recommend to our members. And to give you an example, uh, this can be as simple as raising your camera up on a uh, on a pole to uh, get an elevated vantage point. But usually, it involves uh, either a scan from a lift around the perimeter or a higher ele elevation roof that's on the same facility, or even a scan from a nearby building, a very uh, close building, where you're at a higher vantage point looking down on the subject roof to, to detect the thermal patterns and thermal signatures. The last methodology is superior because you're getting a 90 degree uh, scan. You're looking straight down on the subject roof area. And that's aerial infrared roof moisture surveys. And we're big proponents of that. And we train in our class what the advantages are to aerial infrared versus the other three, uh, particularly where it might have advantages over on the roof or elevated vantage point uh, from the roof or a nearby building, and cover the advantages, uh, like you stated earlier, Greg, where our membership uh, is able to discuss these options with their client, whether that client is a uh, roofing contractor or an owner or a roof consultant or property manager or insurance uh, adjuster. Yeah. And so, the, you know, all the same physics apply. Um, you know, the method is different, uh, but all the same physics actually apply. You got to have good solar radiation. You got to have a nice cool night, and you need low winds, no rain. At least no amount of junk up on the roof is the better. A clear sky is welcome. I can remember standing on a smooth surface roof one time, and a cloud came over, and I could actually see the cloud taking away my infra infrared image as it passed over, and then it came back again. It was pretty Yeah, terrible. that is an interesting phenomenon to watch, isn't it? It is. <laughs> so um, just to reiterate what Ben was saying, the under roof is um, – well, you can use it on any kind of roof as long as it's not too thick to where the heat's not getting through good. Um, but it's primarily used on in between these with the ones with the rolled fiberglass, um, vinyl back fiberglass. Um, I've been on some jobs where I would show the guy where it was and he would shoot a BB gun in it and drain it. I didn't really thought, think that was a great idea, but they did. Um, you might identify, Greg, in, in the slide here, the purlins. Uh, yeah, this area, right, these are the the, um, the structure of the metal roof, the metal decks above it, and this fiberglass is basically put down right before you put the decking on the top. And a lot of uh, seen, then then they seen it. Uh, but what happens is any leaks that get in are going to go into the fiberglass and stay in it, and the, the vinyl keeps it from leaking out. So it can make these big bulges like this. These, you don't need an infrared camera to see. But by, most of the time, they're not that bad. This slide is in here for a reason. Um, a lot of times, the, these roofs are not in big, wide open areas where you can go and wait for the east, you know, shoot the east wall at 9 o'clock in the morning. Um, where you've got the heat coming through and then the higher mass is going to be cold. Um, a lot of times you can't do that because you don't have any view. I mean, this is taken, you can see the fiberglass is down. There's a, this is an office below, and basically we popped out uh, a, um, um, a ceiling tile and are looking around. But it's not as easy um, logistically to do it that way. Um, I did a, a gym one time, and it was a piece of cake because it's all wide open. Um, but a lot of times you've got something in the way, machinery, bus ducts, electrical conduit. Even if you've got a wide open area, you may not be able to shoot it as easy. And then the 
you know, the on roof is the the way that we do that most infrared in the United States is done, and uh, you, you the advantage is that you're you know you're standing on the roof, and you can see things that are causing false positives. False positives are the thing that are the most irritating to uh, any thermographer. And the idea is that you go and mark those places with a uh, paint, paint can um, like this, and then that is left up on the roof for during the day when somebody can come out and, uh, and do the surgical removal of the wet insulation. And these paint sticks are how we do this. Um, and also, um, glad, I'm glad it does, um, because you're taking pr uh, higher pressure and releasing it, um, the paint is cold for a while um, when you put it down. So we actually paint numbers and paint in the paint stick so the infrared image uh, shows the number in. And it's just a couple of example pictures um, of wet insulation. Uh, this is an interesting picture here. If you notice, it's not. There's a couple places where the water's gotten into here, but it's mostly wet here, which is a kind of an odd picture. Um, you can look up here on this roof, and you can see um, the wet that's up here. Uh, if you stand on this roof and look down, that's not a, a full elevated um, survey, but it's helpful. The higher up you can get. Then the more straight down you can look, the better off you are. Um, and Greg, yeah, Greg. Uh, one thing I do want to point out on that, particularly for commissioning, uh, our infrared identifies the solar gain in the fastener heads, the plate, uh, in particular the metal plate. Mm -hmm. And so, when you're commissioning a new installation, you can identify if the proper fastening pattern was adhered to. Exactly. I mean, you can see. <laughs> if you can get past all the wet in this picture, right? You can <laughs> you can kind of see the, the 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 pattern, and you can see it in this as well. If you look over right here on the right, you can see the 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 fasteners right here. And of course, they disappear when you soak it wet, and this is a pretty pretty bad uh, wet roof. Um, with the elevated, like I said, the higher up you can get the better off you are. I love doing hospitals with elevated because typically hospitals have a tall building surrounded by smaller buildings. And the straighter down you actually you get more spatial resolution from doing an elevated survey than you do aerial unless you just go crazy with the aerial and get really, really low with big telescope. Um, so it, it, elevated can offer some of the best imagery um, to a, the purest um, infrared thermographer, um, sometimes you go send somebody down onto the roof to mark the roof where the wet areas are, and and so in this case you could uh, this is a zoomed up image, but you could have somebody stand there and you could shoot a laser down and say, okay, go ahead, mark this outer edge. Okay, here's a little spot. Up, oh, there's one right there. Up, oh, all around this. And so you can just call it out. A lot of times, well, we have techniques that we teach uh, for doing that. It's pretty slick. And then the aerial has, you know, the advantage of having the nadir or straight down image, and there's no oblique uh, feature. So if, if you look at this particular roof here, you can see a perfect board pattern. Um, with with the soaking, and you can even see the differences between the amount of wetness in in those. Uh, a, a lot of times, even though we're teaching a lot about on roof infrared, we use aerial infrared imagery to do the teaching because it's just convenient. Uh, you look at this picture, and you can see that pretty much there's nothing going on here except this one area right here that has a problem. This is about a four centimeter um, image. Uh, the spatial resolution is measured by the ground resolution element or 
the size of one pixel on the roof. So if this was a four inch image, that means that every pixel is four inches. Again, um, the part of the work that we do is to figure out how to transfer the information that we have from being on the roof or being above the roof or flying over the roof or being under it to some type of map so that somebody can go out and fix it. Uh, you, it's really great to put paint onto a roof, but if you're doing a million square foot roof, it doesn't make sense. Nobody is going to replace everything in a million square foot roof long enough uh, or in the time frame before the paint disappears. So it, CAD drawings, um, Im images overlaid, um, drawing over the top of Google Earth photos, we have several different methods for doing it. Um, the reason we, when we use aerial infrared is when we have inaccessible roofs, dangerous roofs, and in the class, Ben has this one picture. I'll tell you, I wouldn't go up on that roof for all the tea in China. Me either. I mean, there we've got pick. We got you know, Ben. What one thing that Ben brought um, uh, as the technical director is this vast library of scary things. And, and, and unbelievably bad conditions on roofs that he collected over the years of, of doing this. And um, I, remember, I, I remember looking at a couple of them and, and, and thinking to myself, I don't know how the roof isn't caved in. Um, when you want to trend a roof doing um, uh, anything other than elevated, an aerial won't work. You don't walk up on a roof and take pick. You just you couldn't keep up with it on even a fifty thousand square foot roof. Giant roofs, aerials, ten times better. Lawsuits. We a lot of times we're we're, we're expert witnesses um, with respect to infrared, and Ben is one with respect to roof construction and um, that kind of thing. But. Uh, when we do a, a work on a lawsuit, generally we do not only aerial but also on roof. We do both, and we have reasons for doing that. Uh, roof where no access is granted. Um, reconnaissance missions. And the most difficult roofs to scan. And here's your quotable quote for today. It, it's... With respect to infrared thermography and taking pictures, the farther away that you can get from the subject of the survey while still maintaining enough spatial resolution and thermal sensitivity to figure out what's going on, the better off you are. <coughs> A lot of times slight nuances of temperatures mean something. So if you're, I mean, the, we, 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 we often get pictures that people will send us, not our members. I mean, once they've been to the class, they wouldn't dare. But to send us a picture of a three-square-foot area on a roof and say, is this wet? I mean, it's just ridiculous. Um, some of the reports that we have seen in, in you know, working on the uh, litigation and working on um, – just being around the roofing industry and the infrared roof moisture surveying industry, unbelievable. This absolute pure incompetence and even sometimes fraud. <coughs> Excuse me. So, now, like I said, with um, roofers and roof consultants and the people, they don't care what fancy camera we do. They don't care what time of night we go out. They don't care about anything except, a hey, mister, where's the water? Where's the moisture in the roof? So whether we walk on the roof, look out from underneath, fly over it, or get on a higher roof or a lift and look down, that's up to us. The main thing is where's the water? 
Now, let's get something a little bit more complicated. Um, let's say that you have multiple layers. Let's, let's just look at uh, how complicated just the slightest bit of building science is right here. So there's the picture. And I'll flip back and forth so you can see it. Um, I know there's a delay with this go-to webinar, um, so I'll, I'll, I'm going to do it a little slower than I would normally if you were sitting here at my desk. But if you look, you can see in the infrared what looks like a 3D image. Um, right here, this is water that's in the top layer of insulation. So this roof has membrane has a layer of insulation, it's got another roof deck underneath it with some insulation underneath it. So this, this is a perfect example of how sometimes you have water in multiple layers. These right here are patches. Here's a wet spot under the patch. I'll flip back and forth. You can't see anything from the photo. There's another wet spot in a, in a patch that under the bottom roof. Here's a wet spot. <coughs> Excuse me. Here's a wet spot. Here's a, uh, this is another wet spot in the top roof that's covering over this one. Lately, green roofs, um, are being touted by governments and manufacturers and everybody else. Um, I hate to tell you this, but white roofs may not be as reflective as you think. In infrared, which is what matters, not, not visual light, um, sometimes the roof's not quite as reflective, and, 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 and part of the trend is to use a non-absorbent insulation right under the layer. The problem with that and any kind of insulation you put into a building, imagine that you put down a board insulation, and most of them are put down during the winter, I mean during the summer, or either put down at a time when, when the insulation actually is fit together with another piece, the temperature is not that cold. So the problem is <coughs> the expansion and contraction rate um, of even board insulation, which doesn't have all that much mass, it does have a, an expansion rate that is, will be surprising to you. This is a data center, and it has a lot of positive pressure in the building. And so you can, you can see all those places. They're not wet. Well, there's a couple of them that are wet, but 99.9% .9 of this roof is dry. That is heat leaking out. Again, false positives. Figuring out what not to report is often more important than what to report. So we did a test for um, a home improvement outfit, and which I've been doing work for for many, many years. And if you notice this, you can see that you can see every board of insulation in this roof. And then we went and pressurized it uh, 25 Pascal, which is a canary can hardly feel it. 25 Pascal is about one-tenth of one inch of water. It's noticeable if you're standing at a door. And look what happens. We pressurized this building by um, zip screwing shut a couple of these, well, actually about 10 of these um, RTUs. And we just bumped the pressure up. And if, as you can see, it's just amazing how much air pressure. Now, what has that got to do with moisture in the roof? excuse me, a lot. Let's say that you have, a, that this is a winter night, and it's a bunch of warm, moist air inside the building, and the, um, the, that moisture is being, that pressure drive is going up and going through 
when it hits that cold surface in the winter, it is going to condense and it's going to sit on that facer. Eventually, it's going to get into the insulation. Typically, ISO boards, polyisocyanurate, uh, EPS, expanded polystyrene, and uh, extruded polystyrene products um, have a low absorption rate when you put them into a building, but a lot of, thing, a lot of things affect it over the years, the, mostly UV. Um, if you put, you know, if you got a bunch of rocks, you know, uh, ballast on a roof, you'll slow down some of that um, UV, but not all of it. So the constant heating and cooling, pressure drive, chemicals, I mean, the world. The building is trying to turn back into dirt, and the insulation in the roof is no exception. So... I want to show just a couple, one idea here also is imagine that um, you're part of this roof scan iron network, which is, you know, the reason we're putting this on isn't to tell the world how to do roof infrared. We want you to join our group. And one of the perks, as Ben pointed out, is that you can resell our aerial infrared. And that there are different bunch of different products like this area scan IR, which is basically um, we shoot these big areas. Whenever we're doing a job, we kind of do this on spec, and we fly back and forth. We mosaic it. We put it into um, the format uh, that we can see, and then basically there's a Google Earth image and there's an infrared image. Um, taken out of that big mosaic. And um, Ben, can you talk without saying the names about the Birmingham, uh, about, and you're in Birmingham, Alabama, uh, talk about the job that we did um, when we went back in the archives? Glad to. It's uh, very fascinating because the aerial infrared had been done a number of years ago and had indicated uh, considerable moisture in the original roof on the building. Um, it was recover roofed. That means a new roofing system was applied over the roof area without removing the concealed moisture in the original roof, unbeknownst to us. And we have been recently involved with this uh, facility, with the building. And it's uh, one of the situations where we work hard to help people avoid uh, finger pointing contest uh, as to who shot John. But uh, we're big proponents of a proactive infrared moisture scan prior to any major repair or prior, certainly prior to recover roofing to avoid uh, roofing over a uh, damp or moist condition. And again, the rationale there, the reason um, that moisture can be ruining the decking, it can be ruining the fasteners, and the, the wet insulation does not provide the thermal resistance to dry insulation and can cause problems. Unfortunately, well, uh, worse than that, uh, all this moisture up there can come to the interior to where you actually have uh, roof leaks. And as the warm sun heats up uh, the wet roof, uh, there's greater likelihood of moisture going to the interior and damaging either finished goods, stored good equipment, or furnishings. Well, and, and two, the warranty issue here. These guys who remain unnamed and will always, um, major manufacturing company, and not they're not like they're not different from any of the most of the other manufacturers. They have a warranty, but they don't really do it. They don't do the moisture survey, and then they give them these people a warranty. But most warranties, uh, frankly, I don't think have a lot of value other than uh, in the sale of the job. 
Uh, but um, when you have when you have an infrared image of, let's say this roof was taken in 2006, and it was visited by a hailstorm, and somebody makes a claim, and the whole roof is damaged, or it's it's a, a new infrared is done and it's all damaged, um, they can go back to the warranty and say, well, wait a minute, the, the insurance company, and they ought to if they were if they're smart, go back and get this archived information. And say, hey, that roof was already wet before any hailstorm hit. So, and certainly, bearing to the warranty issue, like you stated, uh, all manufacturers either recommend or some require that the roofing contractor certify or verify, confirm to the manufacturer that the roofing, uh, existing roofing, is dry prior to a recover roof. And that's a mandate for the manufacturer in issuing their warranty for the recover roof, the roof, new roofing materials that will be installed over an original roof or an existing roof. And it's very important um, that the roofing contractor or property manager ascertain that it is a dry roofing substrate to receive the recover roof. Now, like you stated, uh, what happens if that isn't uh, implemented, if a scan's not performed, if uh, concealed moisture is not removed, and a new manufacturer's warranted roof is installed over the wet substrate, and there are subsequent problems, who has culpability? Well, you know, that's the whole thing about this United Infrared thing is that we're you know, we're not just you, if you get, if you do this kind of work, and you're out there by yourself, then you probably don't have this capability. But if you're a, a, a roof scan IR member, then you absolutely do, and you have. And there's a bunch of benefits which I want to talk about. Um, so with respect to the area scan, you can buy a giant image and go look through it yourself and pick out the wet, wet roofs, and or you can sell them to a roofing company, or maybe you're a roofing company, and you can go look at a given area. That's areascanir.com and look under archived imagery. And, um, and you can resell the images. Or you can, um, uh, uh, over the past, I don't know, three or four months, we've done several walk-on jobs, and but the guy had the basis was an area scan IR image that he are, that we already had of a, of a roof, and it's really nice to know that a roof is doable. It's a good feeling. Uh, I wanted to show this one last, a uh, couple of last slides here. Um, this is a newly coated, well, it's 2011, but you can see, what is this, 18 months or something, 16, uh, 12 months, is uh, it's uh, 14 months later. Um, we did an infrared scan on the left, and I'll show you the infrared picture, it's right there. We did a scan on the left here, and we marked this area as number five, and then we came back. <laughs> We get, so then they recoded the roof, and then we came back, and we shot it, and we decided we'd keep the same number. So we put all the same numbers on it. There was a couple of them that were gone, but most of them were still there. So coating over the roof, a wet roof is just dumb. Uh, uh, I, I like the foam. I like the foam products um, um, a lot. You know that it's kind of very divided in the roofing industry about foams and coatings and things like that. But um, I've seen the foam work wonders, and um, but if you cannot put it down on wet insulation, if you can't just spray it on wet insulation, it's bad. All the manufacturers that I know of of the um, the uh, uh, urethane foam, spray foams, 
they all strongly recommend doing infrared. Well, this is something that Roof Scan IR's corporate people like to do. We like to go to the manufacturers and say, hey, let us be your one and only source for doing the roof infrared and because we bring a consistent product. And in that, those national sales um, are one of the big advantages of this roof scan IR network. So the case for using IR on roofs, you perform infrared P, uh, PDMs of your client's roof and you extend its life. There's no more waste. There's, the waste is unbelievable um, that goes on every day. You commission new roof installations, makes the owner feel good about the job. Even if we find, this is very surprising to roofing companies, but I tell them, even if we find a couple of spots, that owner is going to be happy because he's going to say, okay, the guy's made a couple, look, to air is human. There's always, there's no perfect roof. So, we go out, we find a couple of wet spots where they missed something or they laid a wet board down or whatever. And it gets fixed. Yes, it costs the contractor a little bit to go fix it. But his customer is actually going to be happier because he did this verification. I mean, it's the same way with insulation contractors. They hate the idea and the prospect of doing infrared and to see if they've got spots missing. But if they're 99.9% .9 full of insulation, that's good. Even if they have to go back and fix a couple of spots, that customer is exceedingly happy because the perception is that they got it done right. Um, okay, finally, and train moisture contamination in the roof prior to a recover for the warranty. Know where and how much water is in the, of the roof is wet so that your roof contractor can adjust their bid and win the job. Uh, the smartest roofing contractors I've ever dealt with in my life would hire me to go fly over a roof, no fancy AutoCAD at that moment, just go take a picture and see how wet the roof was. Now, especially when they have the, the part in there about R and R, right, remove and replace wet insulation. That that could really skew your bid one way or the other. Knowing, that we, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, if if you uh, walking up on a roof to feel soft spots, come on, that doesn't work. I mean, it works to a certain extent. You can walk up, especially a guy who's you know been doing this for thirty years, can walk up onto a roof walk around it, feel it, look at the stuff. He knows if it's a bad roof, but he doesn't know where all the water is. He doesn't have this infrared vision that we have. Well, the other side of that coin, Greg, is to protect the owner or the property manager in, in that if, they, uh, if they're contracting for a recover roof and they have that R&R phrase in there with the unit price, they could have a huge add to their project cost uh, on a wet roof, couldn't they? Absolutely. I mean, if 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 it would be a smart contractor that would hire us to take infrared imagery, I don't care how we do it, but to take infrared imagery of a roof bef while, before they turn in their bid, and maybe they're going to lose the job because the other guys are going to underbid it. But at least that, they, that they'll let those guys lose money, and then go out and find a job where they can make some money. And the other uses, uh, of, of the other case um, for using infrared is uh, licensing this um, imagery for marketing. Um, so we're, we're not quite done. But I want to stop at this point and tell you, give you some contact info, and if you're watching this, on the recording, you just push the pause button right uh, now. And so you're, if you call that 888-SCAN-4-IR number or write into admin at roofscanir.com, you will quickly get 
a response from our technical team. Now, that's not about, you know, sales of cameras and stuff like that. Nothing to do with us. Admin at Roof Scan IR is about is the technical team about surveying roofs. Um, and so let me do a little sagacious advertising for just a moment. So if you go to www.blog.unitedinfrared.com, you're going to arrive on a page that's got the infrared training, uh, United Infrared Training Calendar on it. It's got some cool videos. If you notice over on the right, it's barely showing there. We're having, we had a great conference in San Diego of all the UI people. It was, it was just a fantastic um, event. And we had a trade show. We had a bunch of classes. We probably, I don't know how many classes we had, but we had a lot. And very specific classes on things. Um, ben taught uh, two or three classes on between roofing and, and uh, building science. And um, we had to get the biggest room for his group because a lot of people were interested in the building sciences. You know, when I got into the infrared business back in the 80s, um, we were in doing buildings for energy loss. Um, that only lasted a couple of years before we figured out and the world figured out that nobody cares about energy. Then we started doing electrical and the business took off like crazy. But it was still back in the early 90s uh, doing electrical scans. It was not that popular. Uh, I had to make my own work. But once I got a customer, he was mine for life. And I had a bunch of big corporations that I did a lot of work for. But part of, part of this thing about this United Infrared is that we have all these technical people. Um, Scott Wood, I could name off a whole bunch of people. There's 20 or 30 people that actually do teaching for United Infrared. They're all very, very good um, at teaching, and they're also very good at whatever the application that they're doing. And we've got a class in Irvine, California, and if you're on the East Coast, too bad. I know it's a long way. It's a four-and-a-half-hour flight for most people in east of the Mississippi. I hate the trip back because it's like you can throw the whole day away. But make it, a, this is a three-day event, and you will be so tired at the end of it because we do a lot of work on these tra in these training classes. They go typically 12 hours a day and more. And then we have social, you know, kind of social hours. But anyway, um, we're very interested in, um, I'll, I'll get back to this in just a second. We also have a block wall scan course, which is this predicated on the same principles as roof infrared, only it's concrete in block walls, block wall scan IR. And, um, and that is the day after the roof class. And um, uh, before I go off of that, um, I can tell you that we have so many different promotions and deals, I can't keep up with them. Uh, but we have people that can keep up with it. And the guy you want to talk to is, is um, Gary Michelone. We call him Coach, Coach Gary. And, um, and he will, he'll, he'll tell you whatever, you know, you describe your business plan, um, a part of the thing that we do in not only block wall scan but also roof scan hours, we, we spend a good amount of time talking about the business of infrared thermography and all the other kinds of thermography. So I'm, I'm, I know this is advertising, and I, I, but, hey, you didn't pay anything for this. And I got one more thing. We have a, a, an incentive now. It's called the Associate Thermographer Program. And basically what we do is we're looking for people, especially in specific areas. Are you out there in Nebraska somewhere? Because I need somebody in Nebraska. We aggregate the work. National company says, 
hey, we want you to go do a job in Nebraska. We've already pre-priced the job. Uh, we're going to have to eat it if we have to send somebody from 300 miles away. So we need our little dots spread out all over the map. You know, some places in the country we've got plenty of people. Other places we got almost nobody. So what we, want, we were looking for some highly qualified people to go out and do um, to, to join United Infrared, and we got some resistance from especially the guys who have been doing this a long time that said, hey, what do I got to pay you to go to your class for? Well, first of all, let me answer that. Our classes are really, really good. So no time in a class is wasted if, you, if it's something you hadn't seen before. Other thing is, um, so we, we figured, well, you know, to incentivize these people, let's start this associate the mark for program. And the way it works is you contact Rob Miller, and you've got to have some qualifications. You've got to know what you're doing. Uh, three years is a minimum. You've got to be good, and if – you're, if you think you're good and you've got at least, very least, a 320 camera, um, then you call Rob. He'll send you an. He'll talk to you for a few minutes. He'll send you an application. Ben Hickson, in the case of Roof Scan Art, will review your um, application. You pay 250 bucks, and if you if it works, you're if you if if it's approved and you're good enough to go sit, for us to send you work. We'll send you work, and you're going to pay a, a, a higher fee for the um, for the uh, the commission. So that's how Roof Scan IR makes money: is we charge a commission for work that we send out. It's 15 percent, and you're going to pay 25 percent in this until you pay what it costs to go to the class. Then you can go to the class for free, or you can go to TIC and to a special session, and you're a approved full member. So we're trying to make if it, it and, and look at the bottom note. If at any time in the process you say it won't work for you, you walk away. We refund your money, and we call it quits. So there's the details of it. Again, you can hit pause if you're recording this because um, my time is up. So call Rob, uh, uh, I beg your pardon, write Rob at rob at unitedinfrared.com if you're interested in this program. And Gary, for anything um, that has to do with uh, the membership or the training or whatever, he, he's, he's your first source. So I'd like to thank you for your very, very kind attention. Um, we've run, we don't have time for any questions. We've completely run out of time. So I want to thank everybody for being on this webinar. And, uh, when you log off of it, there's a couple of questions which basically, um, ask you if you want more information. And if you're listening to this, you've obviously on a recording received the, the link, um, to download it. But uh, uh, thank you, Ben Hickson, so much for your time, and uh, I really appreciate it. It's great working with you, Guy. Well, we appreciate it. Uh, in fact, I've got to return a call to the um, Roof Scan IR member right away. Uh, we field uh, technical questions all over the nation on what will work, what won't work, and like you said, uh, you have to wait uh, or not. So we welcome working with our Roof Scan IR members. All right, everybody have a great day. You too. Thank you, Greg. Bye.